Welcome to the Azure for Sports podcast, hosted by the Azure for Sports team at Microsoft. Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of the Azure for Sports podcast. I'm Suzanne Tedrick, and as always, I'm joined by my Azure partner for crime, the one, the only, Mr. John Flynn. <laughs> I love this. I love this. That You're like my hype person. I love that, right? I wish you could be on like every call I do. Suzanne does the intro. Here we go. How are you? You're each other's hype person. It's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm doing well, although I, I have to say I'm a little sad in that we're, we're almost getting to the unofficial uh, end of the, the summer, if you if you can believe it. Almost. It's, it's raining cats and dogs, and it's in the 60s right now. What do you mean almost at the end of the summer? We're done. <laughs> But I feel like it just got here. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But here's the thing. If it was a heat wave, we'd be complaining about that too, right? So in keeping with the Azure for Sports weather broadcast in the beginning of every single um, episode <laughs> that we have, today is a bad weather day, but it's a good rugby day, Suzanne. Today is it a is. good rugby day. It is. And uh, for, for those of you who are uh, rugby lovers, you will probably especially love this episode. Uh, but John and I are um, incredibly pleased to be joined here today uh, with Tina Leroux, who is the founder and CEO of Crowd IQ. Tina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So we're going to try and keep the rugby chat to a minimum. Um, and I can absolutely make no assurances or promises to that fact as well. But Tina's welcome. Um, founder and CEO of Crowd IQ. Talk to us a little bit about what Crowd IQ is, um, where it started, where you came from, and bring us up to speed on what it is that you guys provide for the sports industry. Uh, sure, I'll give you a, a shortened version of a long story um, about actually 13 years to the day um, ago, we figured out or deployed our first uh, fan cam, which is um, an extreme high resolution composite image of a, it was a rugby game that day. In fact, it was the same two teams playing against each other today. It's all coming back to me now. It's uncanny. Yes. <laughs> so, so what that is, 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 is we figured out to take this high resolution image that allowed fans to zoom in and find themselves in the crowd. And that was a, the product was a, a media product. And so we sold it to teams and sponsors because they, um, uh, they knew fans like pictures of themselves. Surprise, surprise. And because we were the first to do it at, at, at that quality and scale, um, and, and the only ones for a long time, we got invited to some cool events. So we've done 4,000 events since, including the Super Bowl, uh, Championship League Final, uh, I think seven or eight Daytona 500 events, uh, NBA Finals. There's a, it's a long list. Um, but if it's, if it's a big sporting event, um, we've been privileged enough to, to take our cameras there. And, and that was the, the first, almost the first half of the, of the story. And somewhere in that process, we, being engineers, not photography people, we thought, but we're looking at all of these crowds and it, it's become obvious to us that some are similar in some aspects and others are different in other aspects. And I was wondering, could we quantify those differences? And, and so we started playing with computer vision and said, well, let's just at least go count the number of female fans at a college football game versus the number of female fans at an NFL game. Is, is there a difference there? And being lazy, I thought, let's, let's find computers to do this. And so from that um, grew Crowd IQ. Um, and so Crowd IQ grew out of our fan cam, fan cam being the content side of the business. And Crowd IQ, the side of the business that analyzes these images through computer vision and delivers data to teams. And so where we are today, fast forward, is um, it took quite a long time to build that into a, a, a scalable system from a technical point of view, because it's not just software, it's hardware as well. But we're currently servicing 30% uh, of the NFL. We're installed in, I think, 20 um, US um, pro sports venues. And um, we're capturing these crowds starting two hours before the event, going straight through and delivering everything from demographic data to crowd flow data to merchandise analysis so how many people are wearing home team merch versus away team merch to to um, some of the bigger names in, in sports that's amazing um thank you and and so i've i've been following you guys for a while right and um 
look, I loved my pictures at the Super Bowl, right? I zoomed in at me and here I am. And of course, I'm, I'm like halfway in a silly pose and looking crazy. I'm like, of course, that's the picture they got of me. Um, but the thing that's fascinating to me, though, is you know who, as a sporting venue, a live event, right? You know who comes into the venue because a ticket is scanned. But you don't know who's holding that ticket. It may be the person who's purchased it. It may not be the person who purchased it. Or maybe one person is on record purchasing 10 tickets, five tickets, whatever it is, right? So when I first heard about you and I started looking into this and we started talking to each other is that it, it became increasingly obvious to me that the teams are effectively blind as to who's sitting in the bowl on that particular day. So when you started bringing the idea of, hold on, we've got this ton of data on who's actually in the venue at any given moment, what did that conversation morph into with the teams versus saying, here, here's a content play. You can, your, your fans can take a picture of themselves and look at us into like, hey, we can actually tell you about who's sitting in your building. How did that come about? Yeah, so, so luckily we were established by the time we, we stopped playing with that. And so we simply went back to the teams and um, I initially, as I do, overcomplicated and explained and used computer vision, this and this and that. And then um, the smaller people in the company helped me to, 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 to make it simple enough. And a simple question was, we asked teams, if you could have a computer look at your crowd for the whole season, what would you ask that computer? And the questions, one of the main questions um, that came up was, I want to know the age of my crowd because, and I said, why do you want, surely you know that. And they said, no, 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 we, this is just a generalized answer, but like we found that so many teams said exactly that. We've got demographic information from the ticket buyer and Major League Baseball was a great example of this. And everyone's telling us our crowds are old, but if you look at the crowd, they're not. And so we could use our technology to look at the crowd. And it turned out that the crowds were 10 to 14 years younger than the official data from uh, that the team had. And that was just because dad buys the ticket and I take my three boys, but they don't have any record of, of, of three kids coming to the game. And so sports like baseball that are family-friendly products got penalized on the data side. So that was one of the questions. And over time, um, these questions evolve. Um, people want to know, but if we run this specific campaign to attract um, female fans, did it really work? And the problem with humans is you, you run the campaign, you walk out, say, yeah, definitely, I, I saw it. There was still lots of female fans in the building, but they're not measuring it correctly. Or the other classic one where that the bias comes in is when the Vikings and the Packers play each other. And both are clients, and and, and they'll the, the, the Vikings would say oh, this, that the whole venue is full of Packers fans, and then um, you go count it, and it, it turns out it's not the case. It's just um, that whoever was looking at it didn't like the fact that they were Packers fans. It stood out to them, and so you can have real data there and saying percentage of fans wearing opposition merch versus home team merch and what do you want to do about it and then measure it over time and see if it's improved or, or worse. Yeah, Tina, it's fascinating. It's when you when you were first talking about uh, the fact that we, you know, we all love to kind of photograph ourselves, putting ourselves in social media and especially at sporting events. You know, I never really stopped to consider that, you know, we can use this as a tool to have better uh, fan engagement to really do some in-depth analysis, and I and I think the work that uh, that you and your team is doing is is phenomenal, um, and being able to see those particular uh, insights. So I, I guess with this revelation that you know the ticket buyer is not necessarily the person that is coming into the actual game who's consuming and doing that interaction. How do you see the respective teams and organizations using that uh, to be able to improve their fan engagement um, initiatives and strategy? Well, it's, uh, it, it's, we're already seeing it in just in game day presentation. So just take that example that I had earlier. If um, your crowd is 10 years younger than you thought they were, then you play different music styles and you set up your halftime show differently. For instance, we track it at, at some of the um, NFL teams. We, we track how many, what is the difference between demographics um, during the halftime break versus the rest of the game? And so the under 21 year olds 
don't get up to go buy a beer because they, they're not allowed to. And so there's a much younger crowd staying behind and dad goes and or someone older goes and buy, buys food. Um, but they sit there. So adjust your halftime show for them. So it's, it's about um, the, the, the live, uh, live event game competes with the screen back home. And so understanding who's there uh, and, and what the composition of that crowd is can help you deliver a better product. Um, in, in multiple ways. It's, it's, you can now not just play according, uh, set up your game day presentation according to the demographics, but you can also uh, estimate the effect of a winning season, ticket prices, and all these things on, on those demographics. And so you can use predictive analysis to say, look, our team has been losing the whole season, which means our ticket prices are going to fall, which means we know there's going to be um, 15 percent more um, youth fans in the building which means we can adjust our game day presentation and, and and convert them into long long time fans so it's it's worth actual money um, if, if you if you use it right and I think I mean it it, it expands to your point right because there's in in the stadium and then there's outside of the stadium how does this affect mm. viewers outside of the stadium there's there's got to be some value here for broadcasters in terms of knowing who the demographic is so they can put the appropriate sponsorship in place in terms of what ads are playing, what demographic are we targeting in the breaks that we have in the sports that have those breaks in between. NFL is a great one, NHL, MLB. Um, do you also see it spilling out into providing some more of a targeted or personalized at-home experience based upon those that are either streaming or looking on linear? That's interesting. It could, but I think there are better signals out there than ours. And ours is very specific on the in venue. And I would say our type of data is more valuable in relation to the, the broadcast in that it can help teams fill venues. Right. Because if, if you re remember our COVID experiences, without crowds, it just doesn't feel the same. And your engagement at home is not the same. No. And so that's not a, it's an indirect connection between the two. But I think that the, 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 the broadcast product and the longevity of it is increased by having people in their seats. Um, and, and, and our data is more towards that than understanding um, the fan at home. And I think, so I get that. I mean, one of the things I read, you, you have your, um, Rachel on your team, your, your chief revenue officer, right? She said one of the goals is to become the Nielsen of crowd analytics, right? So um, I love the fact that one of the things that you do is, is you can see not only who is in the venue because it's not a one and done sort of taking the, uh, a high resolution picture. You're continuously and perpetually taking them through the game. You said two hours before, et cetera. You know, so when they're in seat, but also how long they're in their seat and right. is there pivotal moments where they are engaged with the game, engaged with the handheld, engaged with the, the bowl itself around how important is, is capturing that data to a team? Well, that's a great question. I want to um, clarify one thing there and, and, and and the language is important. We really don't focus on who in terms of the individual. That that to me is a bit creepy. Okay. I, I, would, I wouldn't want that to happen. Um, so, so we don't use facial recognition at all. I'm not interested in figuring out if it's John or, or Tinas there. It's more the, um, akin to having an intern that can count really fast and say, well, I, I saw 15,000 kids here and I saw... 7,000 of them will look to be female. So it's more that than saying, I think I found someone in the crowd. Um, but when it comes to your question in terms of, um, it's a product called attention tracking. So we'll scan the whole venue, all of the fans, every 10 to 20 minutes, depending on, on, on the venue. And then we have a separate system that focuses on a subset of the crowd and we capture them every second. And what we do there is we can use computer vision to um, deduce what they're where they're looking so you get a pitch your role of each face if i'm looking up my the, the pitch goes more towards 45 um, degrees if i'm looking down at my phone it's more towards minus 45 and using those results we can estimate in that song set how many of the fans are looking at the screen in conversation um, with, with with friends so the your becomes really high when they're in session um, and then how many are looking down at their phones and so if you have per second data there and you overlay on top of that 
what was shown on the big screen or what was happening on the field, you get a detailed understanding of, of, of fan attention and which ads work, which um, crowd prompts work and which ones don't, when are fans looking at their phones. And that becomes, more so than the demographics, extremely valuable in understanding what's a good game day presentation. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a... I, I can go deeper because it, some, some owners don't want fans to look at their, their phones. I don't know if that's right or wrong. It's just if they want to measure, if they want to adjust something in the game day presentation and check if it worked, this is the way to do it. Um, we, could, we can literally see it in the, in the data. You brought up something as, as you were, were talking a little bit more about how the, the process works. In fact, that facial recognition is, is not being used, putting that uh, kind of paramount on privacy. The, there is, I think, kind of this paradox between wanting a level of, of personalization when it comes to the fan experience, but respecting the fan, respecting the fact that we don't want our images out there to be utilized uh, for nefarious purposes you know, or extreme monetization. So just curious about your, your thoughts about uh, fan privacy. It, how important is that to you? And then what do you think is the responsibility of uh, organizations, whether teams or otherwise, what is the responsibility to, uh, to the fan? I think that's a great question. There's, I see many tech um, companies and founders trying to understand the legal framework and then sticking to that. I've got a clear understanding of the legal framework, but what's more important is the ethical one. So that goes further. We're not just legally compliant because the, the laws are, are behind on these things. They're different in different states. And so I didn't go, come, come into this business to, to spy on people. So we've always built the thing so that it is completely anonymous. We could have built it differently. For instance, we often get requests to do um, racial analysis and they're Questions are coming from a good point of view. Saying, look, we want to we want to include more um, African American fans, and we don't know if we're succeeding. And I said, look, we'll get an intern to count them for you, because I grew up in South Africa, and I know how that story starts and how it ends. Um, it, it's um, so we we don't do that. And then the other question is, can you tell me who's in the venues? No, um, there are better ways to do that. Um, get get people to sign in on your app and. Um, let them, let them, uh, there are more efficient ways to do that as well than, than taking pictures of people. So I think it's very important. Um, and I, I think the problem is often that these things aren't discussed. And so um, because of fear for action of some sort. And so we're not getting different people from different parts of uh, business and civil society to give guidance or at least have discussions out there that take people would say, oh, geez, that thing that I've been doing, what's the, what's the possible implication of that? And so luckily, I don't just have a tech background. I'm, I studied theology and um, with that comes philosophy and history and these things. And given my, my the way I, I, where I grew up, there's a sensitivity towards these things. Um, and so we're in the fortunate position that we've always been trying to be radically ethical about how we apply technology and the fact that you can do things doesn't mean you should do things. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it is possible to do these things um, in a way that it's safe to the individual. Luckily, um, and I'll, I'll finish the, the long-winded answer with that, your, your, your question was, we have individual needs. And, th and that's, that's why in, in the digital space, individual data is so important because it can be used. But when people are at an event, they're part of a crowd. So I think there's an overemphasis in trying to understand the individuals in the crowd. Um, by the way, it's just not just because it suits my technology, but I'm personally more interested in how that tribe operates than how that individual operates. Because I know that if I'm at a rugby game, I act differently to the way I do when I'm on a podcast or when I'm on a business call. It's, and so you can have all that information about me and you still don't know who I am or how I'm going to react. So for me, there's a bigger interest in understanding the tribe and the composition of that tribe than understanding the individual um, as it relates to sporting events. Yeah, spot on, right? I think that is, I think that's a critical piece there. Is if, look, getting down to that one-to-one -one relationship that clubs and teams can have with their fans is... Yeah 
quote unquote the the golden the golden egg or the golden goose or whatever you want to call it right but it's also a very expensive and what are you actually achieving if you know john tinas suzanne at that individual level you then have to have a a a system in place to speak to every single one of us individually, which becomes costly and becomes unwieldy, et cetera, right? So that birds of a feather mentality, that tribe mentality is critically important. So one of the cool things that you guys are going to be able to do, which you, you probably do already, right, is you can build the profile of a NFL fan, of a rugby fan, of a cricket fan, and say, this is the type of person who goes to a rugby match. This is the type of person who goes to a NFL. They may completely overlap. They may not. Right. But that's important, I think, holistically, because a lot of the questions we get from clubs is who's in my building so I know how to talk to them to get them back into the building next time and get them back into the building for five times after that. Um, and it may not be an individual one to one conversation. It may be they're in a building because they can be with 500 other people in their section that are like them. So don't put them in the oh, section by oh. themselves. Or not like them. Or not um, like them. Exactly. Exactly right. So I think that's critical, right? So, um, and I think historical data is 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 important. But I love you. You, you started jumping down sort of a, a predictive and um, analysis road there. Where do you think um, we go from taking the historical data that we have to then moving into a paradigm where we can, as a sporting organization, can proactively reach out to someone? to get them in the building or proactively change something as to your point, we know the demographic skews um, younger. So let's change the music or let's change the halftime show or something. When does that become a predictive versus a reactive thing in standard day-to-day -day business? Jeez, that's a good question. Um, and I think the answer is more organizational um, than a question than, than a technology question. Because the data is there. The question is if the organizations are able, willing and ready to, to use it. To, to yeah, fair this. point. And, and, and it's very early. I mean, I, I'm I'm gray and old because because I'm early. I sometimes felt we built electric cars in the in the 70s. You're doing the right thing, but you just the timing is not there. But it's it's changed in in the past decade. So, but it's still early. So I, I can't give you a, a timeline on that, um, John. But I can say that um, you can you cannot do prediction if you don't have quality data and if you don't have historical data. So I think that's the phase that we're in now is not just collect there's enough data out there it's it's cleaning it knowing um weighting it so knowing what is important and what isn't important and so, so i'll give you a, 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 an example of you've got in all of this discussion so this is the, the first time I'll, I'll have this one publicly but in all of these discussions it's oh the holy grail is to understand the individual fan and then i'll say yeah that's cool a lot of people are doing that I'm not saying mine is, is counter to that. I, I'd say what we're doing is um, augments that. We have an understanding of the tribe. And that's true. But the real thing is understanding um, the, the clusters, the, the mini crop, the tribe. So if it's you and me going to a rugby game, it, oh, let's take the three of us. Let's take the combinations. It, it's... Um, it's me and an American friend going to a rugby game versus me and a South African um, fr friend going to a rugby game. Am I, the, how I'm going to act, when I'm going to arrive there, um, how often I'm going to jump up and leave my seat, it's going to be different. Now, if you take me with, with my three boys, it's going to be different. The distance I'm willing to walk to buy food is different. The amount of food I need to buy because two of them are teenagers is different. Uh, the amount of alcohol I could consume is going to be different. So... We can understand the individual as much as we like from a profile point of view. We can we can understand the crowd, but what we really need to understand is these these ticket buying clusters, and they're never one, they're never a single buyer, and they're as soon as they're more than six, it's it's a corporate thing. You can understand that it's, it's usually between two and six, and now there are limited combinations. It's going to be a father, a son. It can be a um, two guys from work and two brother, but brothers. It can be five girls on a, on a Hindu or whatever. Um, but that's talking about the, um, <laughs> the Holy Grail. I think um, if we start using data to define these clusters and then use predictive analysis to speak to them, saying, well, if I am yeah. there with my son, right. can you ask me 
on the app, am I here with my son today? Um, and then give me a different experience because you know that and you've studied dads with teenage boys that come to rugby games. You know, this is, they don't want to be in that section um, yeah. because in that section, um, this is what the guys do there. Um, and, and so, sorry, I've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole. No, this is fascinating. It's, it, it's, yes, the tech is there to be predictive analysis, but I think where we've been successful is being disciplined in around the psychology and philosophy um, that makes sports a product, the tribalism that drives right. it, um, the belonging. If you understand those things, you can apply technology to, um, to be solutions. Um, uh, versus just playing with the newest tech and creating cool, cool stuff that will go away in, in six months. That's fascinating to me, right? Because it, something you said, I mean, it, it's absolutely true, right? So if I have different versions of me, depending on what sporting event I'm going to or live concert or whatever it is, and who I'm going with, right? If I'm going to go see Dolly Parton, there she is again. If I'm going to go see Dolly Parton with my wife, I'm acting very differently than if I'm going to go see a rugby game at Twickenham against South Africa and New Zealand with my buddies that I grew up with, right? Those look like me, but they are two very different people, right? Yeah. <laughs> they act differently. They consume differently, right? Um, and they have different wants and desires, basically, depending on what happens on the field. So that's fascinating that you follow that trail down. Um, and it does open up the question now with AI, being yeah. pervasive or being democratized through open AI and chat GPT, for example, right? How do you see that now overlaying the business that you've got in terms of, so we have this data, we have this corpus of data of, let's take the, the Vikings Packers, for example, and you have historical data on it and you have data that you're capturing today. Um, how does the ability to go in and query that data from i call the ceo's office right i can go in there i can ask a simple question i don't have to know any computational language i don't have to know any coding or any putting this together if then then that i can just go how many people are wearing a packers jersey how important you think that's going to be to number one you, the industry and then number two to your solution at crowd iq specifically moving forward i don't think i can overstate it i think it's the biggest breakthrough that i've seen and I've been looking at technology for a long time. And the reason, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of things being said about it, but the key thing is it's giving non-data science people access to data. Absolutely. Yep. Which means, which is a, it's a good segue to what we just discussed, is that um, I've been thinking about sports a long time, but for me to actually create a report, I need to find a data scientist who can go create a machine learning model and know what to ask it her to do and then and then a week later it comes back and it now it's just hey chat gpt why do you think this happened um so you get different types of people engaging with data i don't think people understand the impact that, that that's gonna have um so it's nothing against data scientists i love them i, I I'm, I'm an amateur data scientist myself it's just um you have you need different personality types you need um, psychologists asking these things, um, behavioral psychologists asking these things. And, 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 and the other thing is also um, the, the powerful thing with data is you've got within the sports industry, as with in many other industries, everyone's got an opinion. But if you can back that opinion with data, um, it can cut through organizational um, roadblocks. So you often have a, a CEO uh, or a general manager thinking one thing, and the, the 28 year old person working on, on the ground at the team knowing the truth, but they can't can convince them because it's your opinion versus my opinion. But now the 28 year old person can just ask and say, here's sir, madam, here it is. I do think that they're younger than you, you think they are in that if we play this music, we had more people look up at the big screen. So there you go. So it, it's going to accelerate change in areas like that. Um, in a way that nothing I've seen um, will, um, has been able to do. Going back to some of the themes that we talked about earlier with regard to ethics and, and privacy, now that we're seeing that the 
uh, kind of like the gatekeeping is no longer there. We're having more of this accessibility. How, and we don't necessarily need data scientists. It, you know, it could be you, it could be me, it could be anybody that just has this um, interest or passion. Do you see these having positive impacts for us in, in the future now that things are, I guess, open for a wider net of practitioners and interested people? Look, I think it's like any technological breakthrough, be it discovery of electricity or, or nuclear power, humans will use it for good and humans will use it for evil. My hope is that, that the good will be able to win this particular fight. And the reason that I'm positive on that is that the deployment, deployment is so fast. So as fast as someone can write, some can weaponize AI to create fake social profiles and just bombard propaganda into, into that. So with, with the same level of speed, you can deploy AI to work against that, um, theoretically. Because those are the things that, I mean, the deep fakes and the stuff that's coming, we, we can, yeah. I, I've always felt that, that there, are, there are more good people than bad people out there. And, and, yes. and what, happens, what happens with this, well, that, that's the hope. And what happens here is that it's because it's completely democratized as a technology, I think it has a better chance than some other breakthroughs to, to succeed. That does not mean it's not dangerous. I'm not, and I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about language models at this stage. The ability to have computers um, communicate like humans. The, the benefits of that has to be greater than the potential drawbacks. Um, I mean, education, a lot of people are talking about and it, we essentially have customized teachers. It's there. Yep. No one's, no one's bottling it because no one's seeing they're going to make a billion dollars out of it. But, um, I mean, my son and I, my 16-year-old son and I, neither of us can really code, are busy building an app that will help grade school papers. So, because I know a bit about computer vision, so I'm, I've just looked at, can you take a picture of his essay, uh, digitize that, and if I give that to ChatGPT, will it give me a, a good feedback? And it does. It's there. So from that, we decided, that you, you said I can go down rabbit holes. Let's go. Is that, is that, is, it, is, I'll give you an example. So we, he's 16, and they send us his, his math um, results for the, the, the um, we're middle of the year now, school year. And what they did is they were smart enough to classify all the different um, questions that they have. And so, so they don't just give me his, his overall mark. They give me um, simpler al algebraic equations, uh, four out of six. Complex, um, six out of six. Simple terms, zero out of four. And you, you've got a list of 30 things. I copy and paste that, put it in GBT and said, um, give me analysis of this, this kid's, um, what's going on here? And it told me, well, um, it looks like he's really good at some stuff and um, bad at a few other things. That's a bit surprising. And I said, well, we homeschooled him for, for two years because we stayed in the States. Could that, could that? yes, he obviously missed these fundamental stuff somewhere. Um, well, it's, it's vacation now. It's six weeks. Please create a lesson plan. It'll seem work for an hour a day and help him address these things. <clears throat> Gave it to him, done. So customized expert yeah. in 30 seconds. We're quickly going to get to a point where if all their writing and all their maths and all their science that they're doing is evaluated by, by a language model, that they can get customized teaching, not just um, generalized lo lowest common denominator. Finding information, not having to search. It, it is... If we say education is what, what has propelled the human race and scientific discovery since the Enlightenment, this is like the Gutenberg Press. This is where everyone can suddenly read the Bible. Um, and, and the world changed. And there was the Reformation and everything that came with that. We all forget our history, but those things are there. And that's now accessible. My other child, who's a history fanatic, can ask this thing anything. And if it's too complex, say, well, please present it to me um, I'm 12 and it does it's incredible so sorry a bit of a rabbit hole but no, I love um, it. I remember the question but, the, but you, you, the, the good yeah the question was good or evil if we have a tool 
that can educate the world and that can also be used for nefarious things, I don't think we have a choice to embrace it. I agree. I have to believe I'm I'm with you. I have to believe that there's there's more good than than bad people in the world, right? And because this has been so democratized across anyone, anyone can have it, right? Regardless of age group, regardless of a demographic, regardless of language, um, I have to believe there's more stories like yours, right? Creating an app to grade papers, using it to simplify historical data so I can understand it as a 12 year old, right? Um, my daughter, she she's a bit of a history buff herself, and and we were reading something about history, and she didn't understand it. So would you the exact same scenario you did? Well, let's let's explain it to me like I'm a twelve year old. Um, and she said, "Well, that upsets me, but I'm okay with that because if it upsets me, that means we shouldn't do it again, right?" So bringing it down to those basic levels, that's not in a book, right? That's not in so that, as of today. So you have a book that's written for you in real time, the way that you need to consume it, right? So, I mean, rabbit holes be damned. We're writing this one now. But one of the things that I think is super interesting as well, especially, and I try and bring it back to the, the sports analogy here, is that you have the ability to use an open AI paradigm, right, to learn with you, to grow with you, right? So it's going to start to give you, again, then predictive stuff. So this is what it meant, but this is why it meant that, right? And do you agree? Do you not agree? And this is what we should do next. Right? And this is what we should do next to get the X, Y, Z fans. And we have this, this, this conversation going around with multiple teams right now is that using scouting, chat GP, uh, using open AI for scouting is a massive use case. It's, it's pervasive everywhere. It's brilliant. But now my thought was, okay, how can we use that to scout for fans? How do we use it to scout for fans that are on the periphery of where we usually go hunting for them or where we usually communicate? Because, to, your, to the earlier point on how we started this was we know people are engaging, but we don't know who they are engaging from a group, from a tribe perspective, right? Um, we know someone buys a ticket, but we don't know if they're the ones who get into it. How do you use this then to search on the periphery of your usual targets to expand your fan base, to extend, expand your revenue potential, expand your reach potential outside of your traditional methods? I mean, the so trite, right? The possibilities are endless. But see, these are some of the things that we're starting to see. And I've never in my life, right, my 723 years of being on this earth, seen the advances at this pace. It's just absolutely mind-boggling, right? There's announcements. As soon as we had this announcement, there's another announcement, et cetera, et cetera. So I think to your point and, and following you down the rabbit hole, it cannot be overstated enough, right, that I think this is an absolute paradigm shift for everybody. Sorry, Suzanne, I had I piled totally on top of that rabbit hole. So I'm going to let you jump right in with us. <laughs> I have faith in humanity that we are we are more inclined to do uh, good than not. And I think to I think what you said earlier, Tinas, is that sometimes um, the conversations about the ethics of being able to do things tend to happen much later on because we're trying to focus on the latest, greatest, coolest thing that we could put uh, out there, but we don't think about the implications of what those particular latest, greatest things can do on people, on communities. Um, you know, just seeing, um, just seeing what uh, AI, uh, you know, is doing for for most people who are looking for for work now, um, you know, it's it's kind of changing. Well, do I have to learn new skill sets? Do I have to, you know, do I have to learn how to program an, an AI, you know, chatbot? And so, it brings good in terms of innovation uh, for sure. Uh, but I think there has to be this larger in, in conversation before the fact that. Um, again, this will have an impact on people mm. and, and what extent uh, is that impact going to be um, and how do we mitigate it if there is the potential uh, to be uh, negative uh, forces and impact for uh for the for the world so i i think it's an important conversation yeah, that uh, think you're we don't have often <laughs> well, you're 100 right because and i can i can counter my positivity in saying that i thought social media had the potential to be um positive but it, it's clearly been used to to accelerate polarization and so this is going to happen anyway the question is yeah, so there, there, there. I just just broke down my whole whole, whole argument. I, I think what it does is that technology is important, but maybe this 
to your question of what skills do I need to, to learn, I think your skills to be more human. <laughs> so I have um, my three boys. I did well at school. Um, math and those things came, came naturally. And I did really well there. But I was exceptionally immature um, for a, a number of other reasons. Uh, I, I, I stopped playing rugby, John, because I was um, yellow carded for three games in a row. Um, so so it's a, I, was a, I was a very angry young man. And so as the pendulum goes with parenting, our focus is, um, has been less about how well our kids do at school and, and more about the emotional intelligence. And sometimes I got, oh, goodness, I see my friends there. Kids are going to extra classes. My kids are shocked. They are. But I've, we've never had, because I did all those things and was relatively unhappy for a long time until I met their mother, and um, God bless her, um, it, it, it's, the focus has been on, on, on emotional intelligence, more so than, more EQ than IQ. And it's only recently that I've seen these things that I've, I've said, oh, by the grace, that, that, was a, that was a good call, because um, the, they don't need to be math geniuses, because, um, and they don't need to be the, the, the best writers necessarily. They can, they can be augmented by, 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 by software in terms of these things. But my son saw this and has got an entrepreneurial streak, and now he's got access to tools. Um, with, it's not relevant to the point I'm making. It's another rabbit hole. What's relevant to it is if we spend less time on, on things that machines can do, and this, so this is this is true of was true of the industrial revolution and every revolution after that will be true of this one. It presents us with an opportunity to be more human, to fill that extra time, to care for each other, to be to care for ourselves, so um, to take more time off. But it's just an opportunity. If we're going to use it, we can't. I, I can't predict that. It's as difficult to predict that as to predict the rugby result this afternoon. Um, but at least. But it is the biggest opportunity I've seen in my lifetime. And I don't think we're going to have a bigger opportunity. So talking about generative AI is, is, um, <laughs> is God's work. And it's important that people understand it. And like all technologies, don't re there will be people that react to it in fear. But they're just losing time. Um, so I, I embrace these things as far as I can and try to to be a good guy and, and use it to make things better. And so full circle back to sport. The reason I'm in sport is that in our South African context, we saw that sport did things that politics couldn't. It unified people. And the church couldn't do that. The politics couldn't do it, but sport did it. And so I've always felt that helping sports teams, yes, there's a commercial, strong commercial element to it, but the helping sports in, sports in general, the stronger you, you have these tribes that identify according to a made-up tribe, that's a, that be it a, a, a NFL team or a, um, it, it, at those NFL teams, 50% of those people are, are Democrats and 50% of them are Republicans. And my hope was that confuses the political narrative sometimes. And people realize that they're that they dislike Bruin fans more than they dislike uh, Republicans or Democrats. It just breaks that worldview that of the other. And so if we can use tools like this to strengthen these sporting communities, I think that's one way to reach that as a full circle. That is one way to, to guard against potential evils because the potential evils are creating... People get power these days by, by setting up tribes against each other and, and making things black and white excuse the pun and, and hopefully generative ai that has, has been trained not on, on on binary data but on on complex data can put more nuanced answers in the heads of our kids and they can do a better job tina thank you for for coming we 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 love having you here we love this conversation <laughs> you know we we love going down rabbit holes so so thank you for for going on this journey with us um i did have one last question and usually sometimes for our guests we ask what's next so thinking about maybe crowd iq or what you see in the sports technology space what are your kind of predictions for what's next uh what's coming up well, what's next in front of mind is that the Springboks 
um, should just beat the All Blacks this afternoon and in preparation for the Rugby World Cup. I hope we don't have any injuries. No. <laughs> What's next yes. for, for us? Um, that, that's a, we, we've always been early just because that's our focus. So in a weird way for us, it's waiting for, for, for the industry and, and the world to... I want to say catch up because that sounds um, arrogant, but it's, it's not. It's just we focus to be early. So you innovation is our focus. It's execution because you, you, you've, I've, I've made a prediction of where the world is going and it's going to use AI. And now it's just waiting for, for that world to catch up. So for us, it's just doing what we've always done. I think what's next is, is a greater footprint. I want our cameras in, in all venues. To, to help not just the top teams, but through a better understanding of crowds, create safer spaces, more commercially viable spaces, and be able to attract more sponsors so that teams can tell better stories. Yeah, so it's, sorry, that's not a concise answer, but what's, we're, we're just, we're, we're the boring stuff, scalability, efficiency, expansion but but yeah <laughs> that's what i think it takes doing the exciting stuff to get to the boring stuff right and and you guys are are i again i've been following you for a while and, and i love the stuff that you do and the applicability across sport um you're one of the few organizations that has blanket applicability across any sport that is played in a venue right that's not typical that's very atypical. Typically, you're very good. A company will come out that does a killer app for MLB or does a killer app for rugby or does a killer app for curling, right? You go across absolutely all of them, which is phenomenal to me. And, and, and to watch that is great. And there's such applicability outside of, of the usual suspects as well, right, um, in terms of sports where crowds gather, to your point. I mean, and I love that you said it earlier, right? You've got crowd prompts. Well, we have prompt engineering and we have prompts to, to enter into chat GPT world that people are used to now. So in terms of, of being early, I think it also takes ancillary stuff around you to help you help the, the world catch up with you. And I think the advent of or the, the democratization of generative AI is putting them squarely in your backyard, right? Because people are used to this paradigm now. People have adopted it super quick. They understand it super quick. Um, so I think it's phenomenal. I think that um, I'm going to keep generating and prompt um, engineering until I get the answer for the Springbok All Black game that I want today. <laughs> um, we did promise that we would make no predictions, but I do think our boys are going to win it. Um, I just think that there's going to be a hell of a good game of rugby, um, and everyone should figure out a way to, to tune in um, if you can, even if you're not rugby fans. It's going to be something great. But, Tinas, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Um, this is definitely not a one and done. We need to come back because I love the way that you're thinking about things and I love the way that you're seeing riding the, the wave of technology but doing it in an ethical manner, doing it in a philosophical and, and psychological forward manner that creates a safety for all of us. I'd like to dig in that a little bit deeper as well. So again, thank you so much. Um, this has thank been you. awesome. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for all the great questions. We, we know it's all about the quality of the prompt. So... Um... <laughs> it's been great. <laughs>